Abraham Lincoln, James Garfield, William McKinley, John F. Kennedy, all four fell to an assassin's bullet while President of the United States. But they weren't the only ones targeted, and some presidents actually survived more than one assassination attempt. Number 12. The Two for One Gerald Ford wasn't having an easy time of being the president. He was the only president not to be elected by the public. Being appointed to fill the empty seat after the vice president resigned for corruption, only to have the president to resign for corruption and then put him in the big chair. He also had a hostile congress led by the opposition, and the world was largely in chaos at the time. But there were more dangers coming to him, twice in one month. The Manson family cult was terrorizing the United States, pulling off multiple senseless killings, but they had their biggest target in mind, the president. Gerald Ford was visiting San Francisco, planning to head to the California State House, but danger was following him. An assassination threat had already been called in by an ex-convict, but he was quickly arrested. But in September 1976, someone else would strike. Lynette Squeaky Fromm had gotten involved with the Mansons early on, but wasn't involved in their notorious killings. She was obsessed with the environment and believed Ford was a danger to the health of the world. She also had some less than normal views about what caused environmental destruction, like the idea that redwood trees would fall because of automobile smoke. As Ford headed to the state capitol, Fromm was able to get within a few feet of him and pulled a gun. Having managed to get past security, she pulled the trigger and nothing happened because she neglected to chamber around. This makes some people wonder if she was pulling a stunt rather than attempting a true assassination, but no one was taking chances. She was quickly taken into custody. But it wouldn't be the only time Ford's life was in danger that month. Sarah Jane Moore didn't belong to any cults, but she was no less unstable. She was obsessed with kidnapping victim and armed robber Patty Hearst. Seventeen days after Fromm's assassination attempt, she attended a crowd across the street from Ford's hotel. She was over 40 feet away from Ford when she pulled the revolver and fired, but the sights she was using on the gun weren't properly equipped and she missed. As she raised her arm to fire again, she was tackled by former Marine Oliver Sippel, who restrained her and potentially saved Ford's life. She was arrested and Ford, undeterred, continued to make public appearances. Two disturbed women, but they had something else in common. Fromm pleaded not guilty and was convicted at trial, while Moore pled guilty, but both received the same sentence of life imprisonment. While at first they were both unrepentant, they maintained sterling disciplinary records in prison, a law requiring inmates who had served 30 years of a life sentence without discipline issues to be granted parole allowed both of them to get something highly rare for presidential assassins, a second chance. The two women were released from prison in 2007 and 2009, shortly after Gerald Ford's death of natural causes. Another president barely made it to the White House. Number 11. The Mad Bomber John F. Kennedy met a tragic end and the shot heard around the world, but whether you think there was one gunman or two, it wasn't the first time for the young president. He was a highly controversial candidate as only the second Roman Catholic nominated for president and the first to win, and some conspiracy theorists even thought that he would turn the United States over to the control of the Pope if he won. Where conspiracy theories go, unstable people follow, and one of those unstable men was Richard Paul Pavlik. A World War II veteran and postal worker with no family, he was known for being a local crank in Boston, where he would disrupt council meetings and complain about how the American flag was displayed. But he also held a deep and unabiding hatred for Catholics. And with one about to take control of the country, he decided to do something about it. Pavlik watched as the 1960 election went in Kennedy's favor and decided to take action. Whatever the plan, he made clear he didn't intend to come back. He turned over all his belongings to a local youth camp and drove off. But he didn't keep his intention secret. He started mailing weird postcards to his New Hampshire hometown, boasting that he would be known in a big way soon. The Secret Service got a hold of them and discovered that the places Pavlik was mailing them from paralleled where Kennedy and his family had been staying in the lead up to his inauguration. They also discovered that he had purchased large amounts of dynamite before heading for Palm Beach, one of Kennedy's last destinations. It was now a race against time. Pavlik loaded up his car with dynamite, planning to blow himself up along with Kennedy as the president-elect left for church. But as he did, he noticed something. Kennedy was accompanied by his wife and two kids, and as much as he hated the president-elect, he couldn't bring himself to kill his family. He drove off looking for another opportunity, but the Secret Service caught up with him before he could strike. Pavlik was arrested and taken to a mental hospital. He was indicted for the assassination attempt, but never went to trial and stayed at the hospital for several years. Ultimately, what saved Kennedy and let him take office was that his would-be assassin had just enough humanity left in him to not go through with it. Sometimes what separates an assassin and a failed assassin is luck and time. 
Number 10. The Superfan Ronald Reagan had no shortage of enemies when he took office. The arch-conservative actor turned politician was not only hated by the other side of the fence, but he had come into office boasting of taking a tough line on Russia and Iran, which made it all the more shocking when he was nearly killed three months after taking office, and it had nothing to do with his politics. Instead, it had to do with a movie that was released a short time earlier. John Hinckley Jr. was a disturbed man in his 20s who'd become obsessed with the teenage actress Jodie Foster after she appeared in the movie Taxi Driver, but he despaired, what would she want with a nobody like him? Clearly, the only answer was to become famous or infamous. He initially tried to stalk President Jimmy Carter, but was arrested for trespassing and illegal possession of a firearm. The FBI didn't flag him as a threat to the president, so he was free to start again with the next president. When Reagan was making a speech to the AFL-CIO representatives on March 30, 1981, Hinckley cased the hotel, and when Reagan exited to take a short walk to his car, Hinckley struck, firing six shots. They all missed the president, critically wounding Press Secretary James Brady and injuring a DC police officer. Hinckley fired again, hitting Reagan, but his aim was off because he was tackled by Secret Service agents. He had been caught, but Reagan was bleeding out. So, how did he survive? Hinckley didn't make any critical mistakes that made the assassination attempt fail. He planned effectively, got close to the president, and had the right weapon. What he didn't have was the ability to account for the advances in medical science. It had been almost 80 years since the last president had been hit in a survivable way, and both James Garfield and William McKinley died from post shooting complications. Reagan, meanwhile, got the best doctors in the world working on him in sterile conditions and was able to fully recover from his injuries. Ironically, this might have saved Hinckley's life because he was now an attempted assassin rather than a successful one. He went to a mental hospital instead of death row and was eventually released decades later after being declared cured. One might say this next assassin was nothing but a hound dog. Number 9. Elvis impersonator When Barack Obama took office in 2009, the Secret Service was bracing for the worst. After all, the country's first black president was sure to bring out a whole host of racist would-be assassins, and certain elements would be spending a lot of time whipping up anger about what the liberal POTUS was sure to do. Many people were pleasantly surprised that no one took a shot at the president during his eight years, but that doesn't mean there weren't any plots to do so. The Secret Service was working overtime to make sure no one got close, and along the way they investigated many leads. Some turned out to be harmless cranks rattling on the internet, but others got a lot closer to reality, and one might have been one of the most bizarre assassination plots ever. It was 2013 when a letter addressed to the president was intercepted at a postal sorting facility when it was investigated something terrifying was discovered. It contained ricin, one of the deadliest poisons in the world. This potent neurotoxin has been used in terror attacks and is hard to treat once it hits its target. The poison letter also contained a ranting note claiming that there were missing pieces and threatened that someone would die. The FBI and Secret Service were on the case and they quickly zeroed in on Kevin Curtis, an Elvis impersonator from Tennessee who used the same sign-off as the note, I am KC and I approve this message. It seemed to be a slam dunk, and Curtis would soon be doing the jailhouse rock. But this case turned out to be more days of our lives than 24. Curtis was completely confused when interviewed. Not only did he not admit to sending the rice in, he kept on insisting that he didn't even like rice. The agents were used to playing dumb, but after a seven-hour interview, they were convinced Curtis wasn't playing. When Curtis was asked if he had any enemies, he quickly identified Everett Duchka, a self-described genius who had gotten into a bitter online rivalry with Curtis. And naturally, his response to being flamed on the internet was to assassinate the president and pin it on the Elvis impersonator. The rice in never made it to President Obama, but that didn't help Dushka. He was quickly arrested and eventually sentenced to 25 years in prison, which puts that Twitter suspension for calling someone names into perspective. This next assassin was undone not by aim but by biology. Number 8. Falling Short It seems like most presidents enter office with some degree of hard feelings, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt was no different. The left-wing governor of New York won a massive majority amid the backdrop of the Great Depression, but many on the right feared he was about to turn the United States communist. There were even rumors that a cabal of powerful businessmen were planning to stage a coup before he could take office, so the Secret Service was on high alert. But the real danger came from somewhere they weren't looking. Giuseppe Zangara was an Italian immigrant and bricklayer who was a militant communist, and he wanted to strike against the leader of the biggest capitalist nation in the world. There was just one problem. Zangara planned to assassinate FDR as he was giving a speech in February 1933, only a month before he was to take office. Roosevelt was accompanied by Chicago Mayor Anton Cermak in Miami, Florida, when Zangara struck. But the problem was Zangara was only five feet tall. He needed a chair to get a clear shot at Roosevelt. And when he got off the first shot, the people around him pulled him down. He began firing wildly, hitting five people, including Cermak. But Roosevelt was completely unharmed and was able to get away. Then 
Sangara was arrested, but the seriously injured Cermak was taken to the hospital. But the story of the tiny assassin was far from over. Many of the would-be assassins were repentant and were confused when captured, but not Sangara. He boasted that he was there to kill kings and presidents and mocked the judge when he was sentenced to 80 years in prison for attempted murder. But there would be another tragic twist to the story when Cermak succumbed to his wounds 19 days later. Zangara was quickly indicted again and sentenced to the electric chair. He once again mocked the court and was executed only two weeks after Cermak's death, no doubt cursing his short stature. But did he truly work alone? Some people allege that Zangara's true target was actually Cermak and he was working for Chicago crime syndicates, but no hard evidence of this has surfaced. But a surprising number of assassination attempts have happened outside of U.S. borders. Number 7. Hunted Abroad Herbert Hoover's presidency was mostly consumed by domestic affairs, especially once the stock market crash hit. But before he took office, he had ambitions for foreign affairs. He kickstarted his tenure as president-elect by launching a tour of Central and South America, which included a tour of the Andes Mountains. But as he was heading over to Argentina, a terror attack by anarchists nearly ended his presidency before it began. Severino de Giovanni, a radical figure in Argentina, planned to blow up Hoover's train with explosives. When they were caught, an itinerary of Hoover's train and explosives were found, but no one was harmed. De Giovanni would become the most wanted man in Argentina, but the one person who seemed unconcerned by this? Herbert Hoover, who didn't want any news coverage of the attack because he feared it would alarm his wife. It wouldn't be the only time presidents were attacked abroad. Iran would become the site of one of the biggest hostage crises in history only a few years later, but in 1972 it was still a place where presidents could visit. But resistance to U.S. involvement was growing, and the People's Mujahideen of Iran wanted to make a statement. When Richard Nixon planned to visit to Tehran, the terror group struck, planting a bomb at the mausoleum of Reza Shah, the first military leader of modern Iran, where Nixon was supposed to visit. It went off, severely damaging the monument, but it had exploded less than an hour before Nixon's planned arrival. Was it bad timing, or did the group not want to bring down the wrath of the United States on them yet. It's not known, but this is believed to be the first assassination attempt on a president by an Islamist group. And even in the modern day, presidents aren't safe. It was 2005 and George W. Bush was a controversial president around the world. Newly re-elected, he had successfully deposed the Taliban from Afghanistan and Saddam Hussein from Iraq, for now. But many people hated his aggressive posture. One of those was Vladimir Arutyunyan, a Georgian national who hated Georgia's government for being a pawn of the United States. He waited in Tbilisi's Liberty Square for when Bush and Georgia's president were speaking together. He pulled a grenade, yanked the pin, and threw it toward the stage, only for it to not explode due to it being too tightly wrapped with a handkerchief. This slight malfunction turned a political international incident into something Bush didn't even learn about until after the speech. A Union went on the run and was eventually captured after killing a Georgian security officer and was sentenced to life in prison. But back in the US, some would-be assassins had much more ambitious plans. Number 6. The Bad Passenger who would want to harm Richard Nixon? Okay, so the controversial president definitely had enemies, and not just those on his enemy list. And if one man could have waited a little longer, he might have been rid of him anyway. But Samuel Bike was not a patient man. The army veteran grew up in poverty and suffered from mental illness, but no one took him all that seriously when he became obsessed with Nixon. He blamed the president for oppressing the poor and even sent him threatening messages, but the Secret Service dismissed him as not a threat. The core of his grudge? He was unable to get a loan from the Small Business Administration, and this led him to send rambling manifest goes to everyone from Nixon to polio-crushing scientist Jonas Salk. Everyone assumed he was just a harmless crank. On February 22, 1974, they would be proven very wrong. Bike had been stalking Nixon since the beginning of the year and planned to assassinate him. But he didn't intend to use a gun, he intended to use a commercial airliner that he would turn into a missile. The target? The White House, while Nixon was occupying. Today, this would be impossible. Not only are the cockpits reinforced, but passengers can't bring a bottle of water through security, never mind a weapon. But in the 1970s, airport security was lax. Bike stole a friend's gun and built a makeshift bomb. After making one last rambling audio recording, he made his move, ambushing a policeman and charging into the Delta Airlines flight. When the pilots refused to fly him to the White House, he shot them and commandeered the plane, and a tense hostage situation began. There was just one problem with the plan. Bike now had no one to fly the plane. Regardless of how easy Hollywood makes it look, a random person couldn't take control of a plane without training, and the hostages Bike still had were unable or unwilling to help. This left him trapped on the runway and police fired shots at the cockpit. When they entered the plane, they found Bike dead and the attempted assassination of Nixon never got off the ground. Bike had named his plan Operation Pandora's Box, but it led to a lot of tragedy without any of the changes he wanted to achieve. With three people dead and the other pilot injured, it was one of the deadliest assassination attempts in U.S. history. But if he had waited less than six months, Nixon would have resigned the presidency in disgrace anyway. Sometimes an assassin underestimates their target. Number 5. 
Never underestimate a bull moose. Theodore Roosevelt definitely had his enemies. Not only was the brash progressive hated by many powerful people for his policies, but he was now trying to return as president and upend the two-party system with his new bull moose party. But that wasn't a grievance John Schrank had with him. The German-born bar owner was not exactly right in the head and believed that the late president William McKinley was talking to him. McKinley had been assassinated with Roosevelt as his vice president, and Schrank believed that Roosevelt meeting the same fate would avenge him. And as Roosevelt traveled to Milwaukee, Wisconsin to campaign, Schrank made his move. But Roosevelt was no ordinary president. Roosevelt was famous and infamous for his daring deeds and larger-than-life personality. The man was a war hero and could shrug off pain quite easily. When Roosevelt waved to the crowd, Schrank stepped forward and fired, and Roosevelt was seemingly unhit, even intervening to prevent the crowd from killing Schrank. The would-be assassin was captured. Roosevelt headed to the speech, and only a few people knew he had actually been hit. The bullet had been derailed by an eyeglass case and a thick notepad containing the text of Roosevelt's speech. It had lodged in his chest muscle rather than penetrating his vital organs, and Roosevelt was no stranger to being shot, so he knew the difference between a flesh wound and a mortal wound. There was only one thing left to do, give his speech. It became one of the most famous moments in campaign history, as Roosevelt opened his speech by letting the crowd know he had been shot, and that it took more than that to kill a bull moose. Roosevelt's grit amazed the crowd, and his opponents even suspended their campaigns to give him time to recover. A quick talk with Schrank made it clear that the man was very mentally unwell, and with Roosevelt recovered, everyone quickly decided it would be best for him to spend the rest of his life in a mental asylum. Roosevelt did not win the presidential election, because the only thing more powerful than an assassin's bullet was the hold of the two-part party system, and doctors never removed the bullet, with Roosevelt carrying it in his chest muscle for the rest of his life. But there was one president who had an even wilder response to an assassination attempt. Number 4. Old Hickory's Wrath if there was one president you didn't want to pick a fight with, it was Andrew Jackson. The hard-nosed ex-soldier was an experienced duelist who had reportedly killed several people before he became president. But that didn't stop Richard Lawrence, a house painter who was convinced Jackson was responsible for many of his woes. Something most of these assassins have in common, they have an inflated opinion of how often the president thinks about them. He quit his job, behaved erratically, and became convinced that he was actually a long-lost King of England. Why wasn't he receiving his rightful due? Well, obviously it was because Jackson was personally keeping it from him by not establishing a national bank. Clearly, there was only one thing to do. Lawrence was viewed by most as an eccentric madman who wanted to be referred to as King Richard. No one thought he was dangerous, and this was before there had ever been a presidential assassination attempt. The president barely had any security, so Lawrence was able to stalk Jackson easily. Carrying two pistols, he staked out a position near Jackson's path at a funeral of a congressman, stepped out, and fired. Or rather, tried to fire. The gun jammed. Lawrence quickly grabbed his second pistol, and it jammed as well. Was it the worst luck in the world? Most historians believe the humid weather in South Carolina that day might have affected the old-fashioned pistols. One way or another, Jackson was no longer the one in danger. As soon as he realized what happened, the president immediately grabbed his cane and began savagely beating this would-be assassin. It took the crowd, including Congressman Davy Crockett, to separate the two and restrain Lawrence. Knowing Jackson, they might have just saved his life. Lawrence was put on trial and proceeded to turn the entire courtroom into a sideshow, where he claimed he didn't recognize the court and he was the only one with the right to pass judgment. It wasn't a surprise when the jury quickly found him not guilty by reason of insanity, and the presidential assassin went to a mental asylum for the rest of his life. But the plus side of that? Andrew Jackson probably can't get to him there. This next attempt had effects that rippled for decades. Number 3. The Gulf Plot George H.W. Bush had lost re-election due to the economy, but he still had one accomplishment to fall back on. He had successfully defended Kuwait from Iraqi invasion and was seen as a hero there. Three months after he left office, he was invited back to Kuwait to speak at their university. However, it wouldn't be a smooth visit. Before he arrived, Kuwaiti authorities worked overtime and captured a cell of 14 men from Kuwait and Iraq who had smuggled bombs near the site. The plan was to detonate a car bomb as Bush arrived and kill him, but that wasn't the shocking part. Two of the men confessed and implicated Saddam Hussein the leader of Iraq, as their boss. The Iraqi dictator had been allowed to stay in office after the Gulf War, but he apparently held a grudge. That was enough for President Clinton to retaliate with missile strikes against the Iraqi government building. But someone else held a grudge for much longer. When George Bush's son became president eight years later, he would eventually launch his own war on Iraq and take Saddam Hussein out of office. But one assassination attempt literally got to the president's doorstep. Number 2. The Siege on Blair House Harry Truman hadn't had an easy presidency. First, he had to take over for the late FDR in the last days of World War II and make the decision to drop the atomic bombs. Then, he had won an election as a heavy underdog, complete with an unforgettable newspaper headline. And worst of all, he now had to move. The White House was under renovation, and he and his wife would be staring at the Blair House, the president's guest house in Washington, D.C. It was smaller, but it was also a lot less accessible, and that would spell trouble, because a group that had been looking to make itself known was about 
about to strike, and the threat would be coming from… the Caribbean? Puerto Rico had been a U.S. territory for a long time and the island was split. Some wanted the remaining U.S. territory, others wanted statehood or a negotiated settlement, but some wanted their independence now, by any means necessary. The National Party of Puerto Rico hadn't had much success in elections on the island, so they were leading an insurgency on the island, one they were about to take to the mainland in a big way. Oscar Collazo and Gracilio Torresola, two militants, decided that killing the president was the ideal way to declare war, and with the president at Blair House, they decided to make their move. After training in firearms, they boarded the train to Washington, D.C. They were about to go down in history, but not the way they intended. While President Truman was napping, Collazo tried to ambush a policeman on the steps of Blair House. A Secret Service agent joined the fight and they successfully shot and wounded Collazo, but that allowed for Torresola to get closer, where he ambushed a police officer and fatally shot him. The only presidential security officer killed in action. However, the mortally wounded officer was able to successfully kill Torresola before succumbing to his own wounds, and Truman was only aware of the assassination attempt at the very end. Collazo survived his wounds and was sentenced to death at trial, but it was commuted to life in prison by Truman himself. Surprisingly, he would be released from prison in 1979 when Jimmy Carter commuted his sentence. The debate over Puerto Rico isn't settled to this day. One president may not have faced the deadliest assassination attempts, but no one faced more. Number 1. Who keeps trying to kill Kill Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton didn't have the most enemies of any president when he came into office, being a moderate Arkansas governor without too much of a national profile. Well, except for maybe his wife, who probably came after him with a frying pan a few times after his affairs came to light. But that didn't keep him safe. He found himself at the center of one bizarre assassination attempt after another. It all started about a year after he took office, when Roland Jean Barbour plotted to take a shot at Clinton while he was jogging. He went to Washington, D.C. to put his plan into motion, but the retired military officer hadn't done his recon. Clinton was on a state visit to Russia. Russia at the time, and the unstable gunman's plot was exposed without him ever getting to fire a shot. He was sentenced to five years in prison for his plot, although it's hard to call it much of a plot. But the next plot would be much more explosive. Frank Eugene Porter was a truck driver and petty criminal who had failed attempt at a military career and no apparent grudge against the president. So what possessed him to steal a single-engine plane while drunk and fly it into the White House? He tried to crash the plane directly into the wall of the White House but instead flew it into the lawn and crashed, killing the hapless assassin instantly. Fortunately, Clinton wasn't just saved by bad aim, he wasn't even in the White House at the time, staying at the Blair House due to renovations. And it wouldn't be the only time the White House was targeted. Francisco Duran grew up in poverty in New Mexico, and like the last two would-be assassins, he had military experience. But he didn't get it the usual way. He was ordered to enlist in the army or go to jail for Grand Theft Auto by a judge. Shockingly, it didn't work out. He was court-martialed for hitting a woman with his car while drunk driving and served prison time. A year after his release, he showed up at the White House in a trench coat and started firing a semi-automatic weapon at the building. He was quickly captured and no one was hurt, but this was only six weeks after Quarter's fiery crash. What was going on at the Clinton White House? No one knows what drove these three twisted veterans to all make attempts on the life of Bill Clinton, but they wouldn't be the only ones. Halfway across the world, someone else was plotting against the president, a Saudi national by the name of Osama bin Laden. He would even mastermind an attempt to bomb Clinton's motorcade in the Philippines in 1996, but like the previous attempts, Clinton managed to survive without a scratch. No wonder they called him Slick Willie. For more on presidential assassinations, check out Why Did Abraham Lincoln's Secret Service Fail? Or watch this video instead.